Hello everyone, I'm Nicola Solomon, I'm the Chief Executive of the Society of Authors. Thanks for joining us in our Autumn Afternoon Tea Series and this event we are really excited to be holding in conjunction with the Writers' Union of Canada and it's also part of our second Society of Authors at Home Festival, uh, which this time is a nine-week program of online events which are running until 10th of December 2020. Most of our events are free, but today we've asked for donations to our Authors Contingency Fund and the Writers' Union's Charitable Fund, and all money raised will be used to support authors in financial difficulty due to the health crisis. And we suggest a minimum donation of £5, which is, I didn't actually check the dollars, but same sort of numbers. Um, and there's a link in the chat for where you can donate, and we'll share the money with the Writers' Union. And we also have the, a virtual Blackwell's bookstore featuring books by authors and speakers um, in the home festival and you can purchase again by a link that we've been putting in the chat for you. So we're very lucky to have a get as a guest this week Margaret Atwood despite the fact we've only got a picture of her I promise she's there she's just run away to make a cup of coffee um, and hopefully we're back in time but today's format will be a quick introduction for me a few words from John Deegan and then Margaret and I are going to chat for about 20 minutes. She'll then do a reading for us. And then we'll have about 15 minutes of audience questions. If thanks to everyone who's sent in questions so far. If you want to submit them during the session, type them in the chat section and I'll try and get them if we can. If you do have connection issues at any time, try pressing the reconnect button, which usually brings you back in. And I'm going to start with um, introducing John and asking him to give us a few words. John Deegan is the Executive Director of the Writers' Union of Canada. He's a great friend to us in the Society of Authors. He's a novelist and a poet with three published books. And he is also the Chair of the International Authors Forum. I'm on the board, so we work closely together with all sorts of matters of interest to authors, advocating for rights and careers of over 700,000 authors between us around the world. And his work for authors has taken him to the Supreme Court of Canada, particularly when wonderful work in relation to the right, um, the Canadian and UK parliaments, the World Intellectual Property Organization, and the European Parliament. And we appreciate really, John, all you do for authors. You're really tireless. And particularly the Writers' Union of Canada, for those who don't know, our sister organization with the Society of Authors, it's a national organisation of professionally published writers with members in every province and territory. The union was founded in 1973 to work with governments, publishers, booksellers and readers to improve the conditions of Canadian writers. And uh, Margaret Atwood's late husband, the novelist Graham Gibson, was a founder member and is sadly missed, I know. So, John, I'm over to you to say a few words. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nicola, and uh, thanks as well to the Society of Authors, who we consider our dear colleagues across the ocean uh, and partners in so much of the work that uh, that we've both been doing on behalf of authors. So uh, it's a good morning from Canada. Some of our folks uh, in British Columbia and the Yukon who are turning tuning in have gotten up very early indeed to enjoy this. Um, just to let you know, Nicola asked me a while back in the middle of various stages of lockdown in both our countries, if I could help put her in touch with Margaret Atwood, which is a, a request I get fairly often, frankly, um, but never for tea. Uh, I mean, <laughs> how bloody charming is that? Here in Canada, we would try to stick Ms. Atwood onto a panel discussion or get her to sign an angry letter to government, which she's very good at. Uh, or ask her to write an op-ed railing against cuts to library funding. I don't think we've ever just sat down and had tea with her, which is an oversight. Uh, of course, you all know Margaret Atwood as the worldwide best-selling author, winner of the Booker Prize, inventor of ingenious book signing technology. And the reason so many of us were doom streaming handmade related drama during the Trump years. Uh, but we here at the Writers' Union of Canada also know Margaret Atwood as one of three or four key figures who conceived of the very idea of a Writers' Union of Canada in the first place. Um, I've drank a pint with quite a few original union members and heard quite a few union origin stories. Apparently, it started on a front porch here in Toronto 
or in a bar in Ottawa or on an airplane somewhere over the Canadian prairies. But always on that porch or in that bar or flying above the country was Margaret Atwood, urging, urging her colleagues and friends to organize, to cooperate, to share their experience and to build our national literature. So to you, she is a, a duly celebrated author. To me and to so many Canadian uh, authors, she is a leader. She helped build the industry where I work. She is uh, she's foundational. Uh, I'm of a certain age who came through some of the very first Canadian literature studies courses in, in Canadian universities. Um, we're a relatively young study. Uh, I studied the writing of Margaret Atwood in those courses, uh, her fiction, her criticism, and her poetry. Somewhat wonderfully, my student apartment at the time was a block and a half from Ms. Atwood's house. Uh, and my friends and I would share Atwood sighting stories all the time. She and I shopped at the same local small supermarket, and I would occasionally pause to note just what kind of cheese a big time author buys for herself. And I can tell you it's it's only the good stuff. Um, that I would one day have a wonderful job because of Margaret Atwood was beyond my imagination back. So thank you, Margaret, for agreeing to this tea and to everyone joining us and for your donations to our two organizations dedicated to the protection of authors' rights. Um, I have some tea right here, and I can't think of a better way to start the day. So back to you. Thank you. And Margaret, welcome. Good. I was really terrified. You weren't going to come. You've got your tea. You've got your coffee. I'm the only person who hasn't. Um, I've only got my water. So I'm giving an introduction to you, uh, who really needs no introduction at all. We're delighted and honoured to introduce you here. Your work's been published in more than 45 countries. You are the author of more than 50 books of fiction, poetry, critical essays, and graphic novels. I've got a few behind me. Dearly, which is your first collection of poetry, I think in over a decade, was published just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, your last novel was The Testaments, which was a co-win of the 2019 Booker Prize. And it's a long-awaited sequel to The Handmaid's Tale, which was also the award-winning TV series, which I've had great fun re-watching over the past few weeks. Your other works of fiction include Cat's Eye, the finalist for the 1989 Booker Prize, Alias Grace, which won the Giller Prize in Canada, and the Premio Mondello in Italy, The Blind Assassin, which is also behind me there, win of the 2000 Booker Prize, the Mad Autumn Tr Trilogy, and Hag Seed. Um, you're the recipient of numerous awards, including the Peace Prize of the German Book Trade, the Franz Kafka International Literary Prize, the Penn Center USA Lifetime Achievement Award, and the Los Angeles Times Innovators Award. And you live in Toronto, and we are incredibly grateful to you to, for joining us today. Um, and very excited to have you here, even though you've warned in your book on, on writers and writing that wanting to meet an author because you like his work it's like wanting to meet a duck because you like pate. And I'm not sure, but I'm sure that it's going to be a better experience than that. I wanted to ask by asking you to start to give you a short tour of your workplace and your creative routine. Where are you geographically? Who, who are you with during okay. the Okay. Hello, everybody. And uh, lovely to be, quote, here, you know. <laughs> Lovely to be joining you in the cloud somewhere. Uh, so I am uh, physically in my uh, room where I do some of my writing. I'm in Toronto. I'm in a part of Toronto that is, look at a map, north of Bloor Street. And um, John, are you in Ottawa? He's disappeared off for the He's moment. disappeared. Uh, I believe he's in Ottawa where I was born. Um, so I've lived in every part of Canada just about. So I've lived in on the West Coast. I've lived in um, the middle part, the prairie part. I've lived in Edmonton. I've lived in Sault Ste. Marie, which is north of Lake Superior. I've lived in the Quebec wilderness and also Montreal. And my families are from the Maritimes. So... I'm trans-Canadian. I've, I've never actually lived in the Arctic, but I've been there a lot, both um, west and east. Uh, fantastic. If you want your head rearranged, go there. 
Uh, no, my writing space, therefore, is wherever I happen to be. But because of COVID, I happen to be here a lot. <laughs> In fact, I, I happen to be here all the time. So here we have two desks. We have um, a window. We have uh, some quite a few feathers. So uh, I've, I have been making uh, pens out of them. They are not. They are feathers that I have found um, on the lawn or other places, uh, but not not here. More like in the middle of Lake Erie. And then we have another desk, which has a big monitor on it, which is not connected to the internet. So I'm just going to turn this so you can see it. There it is. There it is. And above it. Um, I don't want to move this too much because I'll break my internet connection. But above it, we have a uh, we have a blackwood print uh, from Newfoundland, and those are actually a group of mummers. They still do mumming in Newfoundland, oh, in which um, men disguise themselves in window curtains and skirts. And they go from uh, house to house and sing a song. And if you can guess who they are, um, you don't have to give them a drink. But if you can't guess who they are, you do have to give them a drink. So this is a group of them crossing the ice. It's, it's quite weird. Uh, we have a printer, which is, actually, we have two printers. One of them is attached to one um, screen and the other one is attached to the other screen. And then we have in the back a lot of books. Let's see if you can see them. Yes, we can see them behind Lots you. Books. Wow. <laughs> uh, about half of that shelf is Canadian poetry. And the other half of sh the shelf is books by me. And down below beside it is the international poetry. And um, and all of the Bibles and mythology books. You notice I didn't say, and other mythology books. <laughs> uh, and um, astrology and palmistry, two long-standing interests of mine. And uh, on the floor, we have um, piles. I think um, a lot of writers have piles on the floor. And sometimes they are piles of books that I haven't read yet, and sometimes they are piles of paper. And quite a lot of time they're both. So we have piles. Um, and we have my geranium. Can you see my geranium? Oh, lovely. Still doing well. Yes, it just came inside. Gorgeous. It's a, it's a very sort of French Impressionist geranium which has been going for years. Um, okay, so that's kind of it. The poetry drawer where the unselected um, poems are kept is down there, over there. Let's see if I can get you to see it. Up, 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 tilt, tilt, tilt. This is not quite coming on. Anyway, it's it's... It's it's that way. They're the poems that you, you that are not yet in a collection, or possibly never. Yes. <laughs> and other things like you know unfinished novels, false starts, things that might come in handy later, all of those things. And in its opposite drawer is family history, which is um, long and convoluted. Your own um, family history or family uh, history? My family history. I, I have um, an extensive family in Nova Scotia. And when you have an extensive family in Nova Scotia, you always have a couple of aunts who are interested in family history and send it to you. And those aren't, aunts are no longer with us, but one of my cousins has taken over. Um, so, so I have a lot of family history in there. And now I'm getting more family history because I joined 23andMe and I've got all of these relatives. Oh, wow. I have all of these other relatives that I didn't know about. 
and a lot of them are in New England because this goes back to the 17th century, which is why I get to say harsh things about 17th century Puritans. They're my family. <laughs> <laughs> so you can be rude about them. <laughs> well, you can be sort of, you know, you can't be criticized for for dissing another group because they basically are my group. That's, uh, that's absolutely fascinating. There's so many things in what you said that I could ask questions about, but I'm going to stick to some of the questions we asked as a standard. Of all of those things, are there any that you absolutely need in right, or could you literally sit and write anywhere, assuming that you are allowed to go and sit and write? No, there's there's nothing I absolutely need. I'm, in other words, no cork lined room, no special pen. My oh no, I've lost my lucky charm. Um, I don't have any of those things, but I do need a, a flat surface um, and a writing implement. And among the piles are piles of pens, which I have to do something about, um, and and piles of notebooks, which are in two drawers because, of course, people always give them to you thinking, they can write in this. <laughs> and do you, do you still write by hand or do you ever write straight into a computer? I, I always um, write poetry by hand, which means that it's a journey of exploration trying to type it because my handwriting is quite bad. Uh, on the inside of of this book of poetry, they put one, they put the holograph manuscript that was the most legible. I, I saw that in my copy. It's yeah. so beautiful and it, it feels like it makes one feel a real connection somehow to see handwriting. But could you read it? No, but then no one can read no. mine. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Sometimes I can't read mine. Uh, so that's when we get revision. So you have to try to imagine what word it was that you actually wrote on the paper. So that goes on quite a bit. And I've got the piles of notebooks. I've got the piles of pens. And I always have with me, wherever I go, one of those notebooks and several of those pens. Uh, and on airplanes, it's actually better to have a pencil. Yes. 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 Yes, you know what happens. <laughs> yes. Oh, yes. I've done that before now. <laughs> Pens everywhere. So, you and you're someone who's been who's travelled around quite a lot. So this must have been a very strange time. Not only the very sad loss of Graham last year, but also this, um, you know, being locked down. Has it? How's that felt for you? What, well, um, a lot of the right, uh, traveling that I have done was for um, in-person events. Some of it was for fun and, and e adventure, uh, but, but a lot of it was for in-person events. And whenever we got an invitation to Australia, we always went because Graham, Graham's mother was Australian and a bunch of his relatives are there. So we would do the event and then go visit the rallies. Um, so it's it's always been a, a mix. I'm, I'm not unhappy to be not getting on a lot of planes right now. And it's actually given me some time to sort out the piles. I've made some headway. There, there used to be many more piles in this room. Uh, so, so that goes on. And luckily I have a family and I am able to, um, in fact, some of them are living in my house right now, including a four and a half year old. That makes things quite lively. And uh, my sister is in my bubble, so she can come and visit. And the uh, son, daughter in law, and two grandkids are in the backyard visiting space. So the hot dog roasts can take place out there much to everybody's excitement because it's dark now by the time you yeah. roast them uh so we are we are winterizing that space i've just acquired a sort of little cabana that i can put up which has rollable sides so you can have ventilation 
So we're all thinking of all these things, but being Canadian, we know about winter camping. We've done it a lot. We have a big supply of hot water bottles, which are quite brilliant. If you're um, having a backyard visit, you just fill them up. You give one to each guest. They warm up their core. If you get those reflector blankets, the, the silver and gold ones, and put them on everybody's seat, plus the woolly blankets. We have excellent woolly blanket supplier. I'll give them a plug. They're called uh, Topsy Farms. And uh, John, they're on Amherst Island, if you can imagine. Amherst Island is near Kingston in the, um, the almost St. Lawrence River. So it's where the St. Lawrence River is going to start going into the, the Atlantic. But Topsy Farms, highly recommended, many colors and styles, and uh, super cozy. I'm hoping we'll be able to use these tips. But for us, this time in lockdown, we haven't been able to allow to be, invite people into our garden. You're not allowed, no. even that. No. But they they no. say outside it's very safe. I know. It, don't speak. Don't we, we don't have time to start on the rules made by our government, Margaret. <laughs> no, <laughs> really um, but hopefully they'll allow us to open gardens again, and that will be a, a different. So what are you working on at the moment? Do you normally work on, because you, you work in so many different genres, do you work on different things all at the same time or do you keep concentrated on one thing? Well, it just depends. There, there, is, there, there is no, um, there's no plan. <laughs> there's a lot of um, happenstance. So, um, and I get, I've been asked to write a lot of things during this period. So right now I'm working on um, something for Greta Thunberg's. She's, okay. she's guest editing a Swedish magazine. So now that the, dare I say, election, the election, the election, remember it? Um, now, that, now that we're not all staying up till two in the morning, doom scrolling on our phones, um, I'm getting back to really what is the most important concern for humanity right now. Um, because should the oceans die, we will stop breathing. That's, that's it in one that's sense. It. So I'm writing that. I'm writing uh, for Jamie Bing, Canon Gate, who always makes me do stuff. Um, he made you do the Penelope ad, didn't he? That was he part did. of the myth series. He yeah. <laughs> Yes, he got me before morning coffee. I, sh I should never actually agree to do anything that I haven't already written, but uh, he Jamie's, did. Jamie's such an enthuser. He's, you know, he, he always presses a book on you. He always has a great passion about his books, which is a and wonderful it's, thing. It's very true. He's extremely persuasive. He would have made a fortune selling um, life insurance or something. Or blankets, maybe. <laughs> or, no, I don't think there's enough in blankets for for his scope, but... But um, yeah, selling selling you on ideas is this thing. So what's he getting you writing this time? Uh, an intro to his reissue of three Rachel Carson books. So I just did an intro for him for Evgeny Zamyatin's uh, very influential 1923 dystopia from Russia called We. Uh, this is the this is the book that directly influenced George Orwell, and who directly influenced me. So there's a sort of a, a generational line of descent. I descend from a really crazy Russian dystopianist. <laughs> well, you certainly have done a lot of dystopia in your time, and I do want to go back to the Greta the, Thunberg because. What you say is right. You've been and you've been a passionate ecologist for, well, for a long time before anybody had that that word. And I noticed that in dearly, there's this poem which ends, you know, "Oh children, will you grow up?" And mm. and I was listening to a 2010 World Society talk you did, where I think Sir Brian Hoskins was incredibly upbeat about climate change and how we were going to control it. And you were, uh, I think. I, venture to say a little more realistic and but what I was very struck with in that interview is you said you know people talk about the whole earth being destroyed and you were very clear to make sure that you know, we were actually talking about humanity you talked about how we'll go a long a long time before a lot of those other life forms. Darren Tootin yes um, we are a, a medium-sized 
mammalian air breathing landform. Um, so we need a certain amount of um, air, food, water. I was talking to a paleogeologist about mammoths and mastodons and uh, why they went extinct. And he had their two of their teeth, one from each, which showed what they, what they were eating. And uh, I said, why did they go extinct? And he said, gigantism typically precedes extinction. In other words, getting very big may be an advantage up to a point, but a small variation in the food supply can kill you. Um, because there just isn't enough for your large life form body. Whereas if you're a mouse or some uh, small proto mammal of the kind from which we descended, you don't need as much. Uh, and also you can hide better. So we are not in that category. No. We're in the middle sized category. But we've wandered off the path of, of, of writing. Right. Well, yes and no, because I think. I, I suppose that takes me to, I'm going to go backwards in the question before I go back into writing in a way that does, you know, that does tie in with one of the most important things that come out of the crisis and, and you know, we can't forget the world. But yes, on writing, you do write in many different genres and you said you're not, you know, it goes to different places. What's your favourite to write? Is there one that's the closest? You started with poetry, is it? Poetry that yeah, I actually didn't start with poetry. I started with everything, but it was very easy to publish, or I shouldn't say very easy. It was much easier to publish poetry in the late 50s and early 60s because it was short. Hmm. Uh, so late 50s and early 60s, the Canadian publishing industry that had existed before the war uh, was kind of not there anymore. <laughs> And for two reasons. Number one, the war, uh, where paper was a crucial supply item, so publishing really contracted. And the other one was the invention of the of the paperback, which uh, was invented in the UK with um, and Lane. Penguin and and in the US with. Do you remember those little kangaroos pocketbooks? Uh, so. In the late 40s, early 50s, you could get those in, in pharmacies. They would have racks of them. So you would buy something that looked like a sleazy, softcore porn book, and it would turn out to be War and Peace because they, they all had these very trashy covers. Um, so I think a lot of people got introduced to world literature that way, not knowing that <laughs> they were. Um, but Canada did not have a paperback industry. so. A book would appear, and then it, and it would have its print run, and then it would vanish. So there wasn't any, um, there wasn't any build on. So part of the chore, as John will tell you, in the um, late fifties and and sixties, was building a Canadian publishing industry, and um, therefore it was very hard to publish a novel because you couldn't, unless you had a UK or an American. Um, co-publisher, you, you would not have a very large print run. Uh, but the poets were cranking out their books in the cellar or using mimeo machines or um, because they were short, it was, it was fairly cheap to get um, your own book published. So there's a lot of what we would now call self-publishing going on, but, but that was normal. You know, that's, that's what we were all doing. And we were also doing poetry readings initially in coffee houses, uh, which weren't really houses. They were usually abandoned warehouses condemned by the fire department. Um, so those things would go on there. But the novelists didn't even know each other. So one of the reasons we started the union was that nobody had an agent. Um, nobody had any knowledge of what was in anybody else's contract. We didn't know how it was supposed to work. Uh, we had no sources of, of knowledge. So once writers got together and started compar comparing what was happening to them on the uh, publishing and financial level, we were able to come up with a standard contract and we had a pressure group. 
uh, at various points, we were picketing the government. We were, why is that? Because they were letting in overruns from the states of our books and uh, selling them as remainders. And the overruns were, were being done on purpose. So this was a racket. Um, that was the government thing. We were picketing um, bookstore chains, of which there was one at the time. Uh, so all of that was going on. And these things happen because there's a lack. They, they happen because there's a vacuum. So that's why there was a, a union. And it's, um, it, it, it's, it's just fascinating to hear. You know, I know when we just moved recently at the Society of Authors and I look back through our archives, I would pull out a letter from almost any date and we've been going since 1884. And you'd find we were fighting the same battles and writing almost the same letters. But you still feel we're pushing something back. And to to be together, you know, the purpose of these talks that you are to provide a connectedness between authors and to and to make people understand that right the way through we have the same issues, the same questions about and that if we work together, we can affect change. And I, you know, yeah, some, sometimes authors don't I, really have power. No. They have influence, but not power. Um, but but they but they have a skill, and uh, their skill is putting words together. Yes, we hope, and it's we, got... we hope we hope they have that skill. So so yeah, we can write some pretty snappy um, public letters and letters to various ministers and things like that. And this is right now a pretty good time because reading has gone up. Um, but it has always been uh, the same that uh, you have a pie. I shouldn't say it's always been the same because once upon a time, the bookseller, the printer, and the publisher were all the same person, um, and there were no agents. But now you have a pie, and that pie is divided among uh, the bookstores, the printers, the publishers, the agents, uh, and the authors. And the platforms, really, quite. And, yeah, uh, so, so, so that's what we're up against, and um, and we're still up against it. And that, that's that's really true. And um, I'm going to go back to your own personal writing and the fact you know you have just published poetry. What keeps you working? Do you, do you feel that you have to write? Is it uh, you know you talk about the power of writing, but is it is there something you want to get across? Is it is it possible for you to sit down and think about never writing again? Um, yeah, it's certainly possible for me to sit down and think about that, but it hasn't happened yet. Um, I, I know people for whom it has happened. Um, I think the point at which my trusted editors and agents say to me, I'm sorry, Margaret, but you've, you're really um, below par and this is a horrible book, um, that's the point at which I would say, okay, no more late Tennyson. Um, have, have you ever read late Tennyson? No, Tennyson was actually, you know, the first president of the Society of Authors. Well, I'm a big Tennyson fan of early and middle Tennyson because I was once upon a time a Victorianist, believe it or not. So I'm very interested in books like How to Be a Victorian, which I read with great, great uh, attention. And... Um, there's a wonderful website called, um, or a YouTube series called Prior Attire. And the person doing that is a historical costume maker. And she will show you all the bits. She gets dressed up in these things, including the underwear. And from Alias Grace, I know that the underwear was the hardest thing to research. Because you can see the fashion plates, but not the underwear. <laughs> so, so she shows you sort of from the ground up, including this socks and shoes, uh, how to put these things on, and and she turns before your eyes into a painting. You will you you then see somebody out of a painting. It's quite amazing. Prior attire, highly recommended. Uh, mm -hmm. Where were we? Oh yeah, Tennyson. Um, late Tennyson, I think probably his worst attempt is a, is a uh, dramatic monologue called Happy the Leper's Bride. 
So. <laughs> Probably all we need to know, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's a story of female devotion. Um, because the set in the Middle Ages, of course. Uh, so she, the young couple have a fight and he stomps off to the Crusades, as one does, slam the door. <laughs> that's, that's amazing. When he comes back, he's got leprosy. And she goes, browbeat, browbeat, it was all my fault. I shouldn't have had, I shouldn't ever have contradicted him and made him stomp off to the Crusades and get leprosy. Uh, so I will now move into his leper's tent where I will be happy. Oh, these uppity women, we shouldn't. And, and leprous. <laughs> uh, so... So there you go. How did I get on to that? I think we were talking about whether you would ever be able to stop writing. Mm. I'm going to... I when think, I start writing Happy the Leper's Bride, you know, turn off my... I, I won't keyboard. forget to write your note and say, you, you told me you'd stop at this point. Uh, but you're not doing that now because I think it really is a, just a, like a wonderful connect, collection. But what it does seem to me, and I've you know, got a lot of your books behind me, is... Your books are rather more hopeful in some ways. It seems to me the Testament is rather more hopeful than The Handmaid's Tale. And and dearly has got, you know, it's, it's, it's bittersweet in places. Are you kind of more or less optimistic as you get older? No. Um, not really. I um, based both of those books on um, real things that have actually happened. And you can count backwards and say that I was born in 1939, so World War II is a very big thing in my life. I was, I was born into wartime, grew up in wartime, and um, um, that was normal because whatever a child is experiencing is normal. I think this is this is life. So I've I've all, always been interested in to, in totalitarianisms, but I've also been interested in how they fall apart how they get going, how they seize control, and then how they fall apart. And although Stalin died with his boots on, as it were, um, nobody de deposed him. A number of others have come about because uh, citizens were able to rise up and depose. Um, I'm thinking of Ceausescu, I'm thinking of Pinochet, um, and uh, Hitler, of course, was a combo of um, losing the war and um, having people desert the cause. And and then, of course, as you know, um, going out in a in a bonfire. Um, so I'm interested in that. And and there always have been. Uh, resistances to these regimes, smaller or greater. Even North Korea has got one or two or several. And small um, citizen acts of, of resistance, even though you may not be part of an organization, the accounts of those are quite numerous. So that's what interested me in the, in the testaments. And um, The Handmaid's Tale is more hopeful than you think because it has a coda which takes place a couple of hundred years later. Cool. Gilead, Gilead is in the past tense. It's a subject of study. And um, it vanished, but we're, we're just not told how. Yes, of course, that things come to an end in that way. Well, I'm going to... I better. I'd love to ask you a million more questions, but I'm very aware there's a lot of questions from the audience. And we also want you to read. So I'm just going to... To, to segue on something, in the Testament, Aunt Lydia's last words are almost the quote from Mary Queen of Scots in, in My End is My Beginning. And rather fascinatingly, the very last person I interviewed for this was Lady Antonia Fraser, who wrote, of course, the famous biography of Mary Queen of Scots. And she read from exactly that part. From exactly. The, you know, yeah. the end of my beginning and said, for her, it was very meaningful because in Mary Queen of Scots end was her beginning was that was her first book and so um so I'm interested to know which piece you're going to read from dearly and and why you've chosen it it's wonderful piece well people haven't I'll, read they now should. I'll, I'll, I'll give you some um 
I'll give you some say in that. You, you're interested in the translation conference. Oh, yeah, I have. Why don't I read that one? And it is a real translation conference um, that takes place in Banff, CMAP, uh, Canadian Rockies. Uh, and they have an art center there. And the translation conference, they invite translators from many different languages. And then they invite the author, his passage, all of the translators are working on. And they all have different questions because different things are possible and impossible in their uh, separate languages. Where am I? Okay, what page is this on? Oh, I not Page 66. There, there we are. I'm going to the same one. Okay. Uh, so I went to one of these, and some of these were the questions that they were asking, and some of them were questions that I got from translators translating my books in other countries, and some of them um, came from just reading about different languages and what things have names and what things don't have names. Um, but the part where it says, how offensive is it, though? <laughs> Did you make it up? What, what sort of word is this? At the translation conference, in our language, we have no words for he or she or him or her. It helps if you put a skirt or tie or some such thing on the front page. In the case of a rape, it helps also to know the age, a child, an elderly, so we can set the tone. We also have no future tense. What will happen is already happening. But you can add a word like tomorrow or else Wednesday. We will know what you mean. These words are for things that can be eaten. The things that can't be eaten have no words. Why would you need a name for them? This applies to plants, birds, and mushrooms used in curses. On this side of the table, women do not say no. There is a word for no, but women do not say it. It would be too abrupt. To say no, you can say perhaps. You will be understood on most occasions. On that side of the table, there are six classes. Unborn, dead, alive, things you can drink, things you can't drink, things that cannot be said. Is it a new word or an old word? Is it obsolete? Is it formal or familiar? How offensive is it on a scale of one to ten? Did you make it up? At the far end of the table, right next to the door, are those who deal in hazards. If they translate the wrong word, they might be killed, or at the least imprisoned. There is no list of such hazards. They'll find out only after, when it might not matter to them about the tie or skirt, or whether they can say no. In cafes, they sit in corners, backs to the wall. What will happen is already happening. Brilliant, and I know that many of our translators will feel strongly about that, and, and we and John and others have just recently um, Many other heads have put together a poem for Belarus where exactly these risks are there for translators. So it's a very yes, the riskiest, the riskiest risks are taken by simultaneous translators at political meetings. Yes. yes. Yes, where the translator has to decide whether to actually translate what the other one has said, which is tell him to rot in hell. Um, how, to, how to translate that so that the whole thing won't blow up. Yes. Well, he said that possibly he might be able to consider that later, but not right now. Yes, it's a huge thing. So that's about translations. You clearly do work closely with translators. What about translations? Okay. Um, lots and lots of people are asking about the Handmaid's Story and how that felt to to work there with this adaptation and also with the second series, which is, is of course, not at all based on, on the books. So, how do you yes, feel about it? It is it's, it is sort of based on the book. They have absolutely mined the um, the coda at the end of the book 
And they also now have the testaments, which can give them uh, yet more material to work with. Um, they have invented uh, several other characters in the uh, second and third series. Um, so how is it, what's it like to work with them? Well, I, I used to write for television and film, and I know that, that those are different forms and that there are things that you can do in television and film that you can't do uh, in a novel, and there are things you can do in novels that, that you can't do in um, television and film. So I'm, I'm aware of the problems. I do talk with the showrunner, and um, we discuss general ideas. I read the scripts. I make notes. Again, I don't have any power, but I might have some influence. Um, from time to time. But I, I think they've been doing very well. They they are writing in the same form that Charles Dickens wrote. They're writing a serial, and he, of course, did that, and that's why in a number of the novels that, that came out in serial form, you will find a cliffhanger every three chapters because they were published in little things called numbers, which were like little pamphlets. And the, those would be about three chapters long, and then there was a cliffhanger, so you would buy the next one. And if you watch any television serials at all, you will notice that the end point is always a what's going to happen now. So that is what the writing team, which consists of about 10 people, very they're, they, they don't let anybody in there. Uh, you're not allowed to see what's on their whiteboard, even me. Um, that's what, that's, that's the challenge that they have. So yeah. how much do you put into this episode? Where do you end it? So that we'll want to see what happens next. And it's different from a, a novel that you buy all in one piece, not in serial form. Uh, because in a novel, you have a lot more leisure um, to develop things more slowly, unless there's some suspense or mystery, of course, we're unlikely to keep reading unless we're just interested in the minutia of the person's life, uh, which can be pretty fascinating as well. So what kind of Victorian underwear? Yes, uh, <laughs> it's a very different way, as you say. Someone, um, Maria Elizondo has asked a question, do you set a, a daily word goal for yourself when you're writing, or do you set aside a specific amount of time to write? Yeah, it's it's pages. So I have a, a page goal, and I do keep track of them, but of course, then you come to the part where you have to throw out pages. Yes. So then it goes down again, and then it goes up, and then it goes down. <laughs> so it can go like that, and when I get... Uh, probably about three quarters of the way through, I make a little color chart for my um, agents and publishers that shows uh, colored in squares for chapters that are finished and uh, empty squares for chapters that I know I'm going to be writing but haven't written yet. It gets them very excited because then I send a new chart with different squares colored in and they say, oh, look, she's colored in another square. <laughs> you refer to charts and, and colouring and um, and there's been various questions about the different kinds of other art forms that inspire you in your stories, music, painting, dance, etc. Someone said they've seen some brushes in the background and ask if you draw and I know you do puppetry. Yes. Are you very visual in that way and, and which bits, uh, which of those art forms most inspire you? Yes, that's in this drawer. So we have... Uh... Let's see, we have a, a painting that is part of the series that mm -hmm. I did for um, uh, the book cover of one of my books of poetry. We have the original, um, the original logo for the long pen, which was the uh, video, the remote signing thing that we did, and but it's now morphed into... Um, a signing uh, platform app for identity, certainty, and uh, security 
for high level signatures on contracts are really just any old signatures. So there and here we have a lino block that I did for a fundraiser for Penn and what else have we got in here? Quite a few things. Right. <laughs> yeah, I still do cartoons. That one was for my publishers. It says, I'm heading out on a book tour. The heart says, <clears throat> stay nasty. <laughs> <laughs> Goes on from there. I like that, stay nasty. <laughs> Yeah, so and you've got lots of things there. Do you keep all your early drafts of novels, poetry, etc.? And what do you do with it? Those notebooks that you were talking about before, or do you get well, rid of them? All? There's there's a, a handy thing in my city called the Fisher Rare Books Library, and I donate to them because otherwise it would be the waste paper basket. Uh, so they're always happy to to have them and if I need to go back and look for something which I which I do I know that they have it won't lose it and are taking care of it so it won't just be in a pile on my floor or um, somewhere in a drawer and then I can't find what I'm looking for and when so, you're writing yeah at what stage do you let someone else see it how much do you self-edit before you give it to an editor? How how involved are editors in your process? Or do you give something pretty much finished? Or do you like to give it sort of halfway through for their thoughts? Never would I give it halfway through. Um, no, I think they have to be able to have the whole thing so they can see where it's going. And then something that might not make sense to them if it were halfway through and they didn't have the end. Uh, they can see why that is there. But um, I do work with editors, I always have, and uh, there's two kinds of, and, and I've been an editor. So I used to run the poetry list for this little company that we started in the 60s, which is now a mid-sized um, company in Canada called the House of Anansi. Uh, one of its authors just won the Giller. So, Jill Adamson. Um, yes, I, I, I understand it. <laughs> and I'm, I'm not rude to my editors because what would we do without them? Yes, definitely. Uh, and then I work with a copy editor called Heather Sangster. And for editing the Testaments, we had a pretty dramatic occasion because she arrived. We do this in person. We turn the pages like this. Uh, so we both have the same manuscript. She arrived at the door and said, I've just been hit by a truck. And I said, oh, no. She said, yes, I was crossing the street on my bicycle, and this truck just came out of nowhere and, and hit me, ran a light. And the bike is a wreck. The paramedics came. They said, I haven't broken anything. And the, the two old guys driving the truck who were horrified gave me a list, a lift to your house. I said, this is terrible. You should go home. You need to be at a hospital. No, she said, I'm ready to edit. And so we, <laughs> we oh, gave so her some painkillers, an ice pack, glass of scotch, and, and, and we edited. <laughs> wow, that's devotion. I'm going to ask you well, one, two more questions. I went way over time, and I promised I wouldn't be, so I'm going to let you go in a minute. But Joyce Ireland says, when should I stop joining lots of online writing and history classes and actually submit something for publication? When should you? Mm. Um, when you're ready. All right, so when you think. Uh, I am visualizing my book in a bookstore. It has this snappy title and a great cover. Somebody's picking it up. They're opening it and they're reading the first page, and, and, and then they're turning the page and reading on. That's when you should do it. When, you're ready, when you're ready to be read. <laughs> so I'm sure that's really good advice. And I'm going to ask, because of doing this jointly with, with Canada, which is really important, and just sorry to everyone whose questions we haven't got to, but Ali Sherrick says, what in your view do the great Canadian novelists share in common? 
what makes their work unmistakably Canadian, and I'm going to ask them what makes your work unmistakably Canadian. Well, a lot of people live in Canada but write about other countries. So when I was writing Survival in 1972, there was a small enough body of work so you could actually generalize about it. Uh, but I, it would be very hard to do that anymore. Um, so, so I would have to give that a lot of thought. Uh, I will say that it's different writing from a country that has never been an empire. Uh, it's not that they have not indulged in colonial practices within Canada because they have. Um, it is not that they're more virtuous. It's not that they're um, sort of genetically different in any way. Uh, it's not that they're better. There are certain personality behaviors that are more typical of small countries that have never been empires. Um, so, so you could add that into the mix. Uh, certainly in the 60s, we were, uh, the challenge was to assert that there was such a thing as, as Canadian literature and that it wasn't just a pale reflection of, of elsewhere. And you don't have to prove that anymore. So the young writers of today uh, came into a world in which that had already been done. Similarly with the Writers Union, they came into a world in which you didn't have to um, fight for those particular things in which there are already a bunch of agents, uh, in which there's, there's already um, the knowledge that there is a community, there is a possibility here. When I started, people would say, well, you, if you're going to write, you better leave. You know, you need to go to London, Paris, New York. You, you can't do it here. There isn't a readership. People don't care. Uh, but that has all changed. However, with the diminishing of book reviews, which they have, the shrinking of local newspapers, uh, the advent of the online, uh, the share of, of market for Canadian books has gone down. So the thing that we built out really pretty spectacularly in the 70s, 80s, and 90s has, has now started to shrink, and more effort has to go into that. And um, I would say, all right, more attention to local, more attention to your city, your community, your town, um, and more uh, resources made available um, to readers, I would say, in particular. Because when we started, when I started doing the Canadian literature thing, traveling across Canada on a Greyhound bus with my books in a cardboard box, because there weren't any bookstores in some of these places, um, they would say, but there isn't any Canadian literature. There was, but they had no access to it. So so making people aware of, of what is there and... Um, of course, you are still uh, in the same great big book barrel as books from everywhere. I think those points are so well made. I think, and I think your comments about localism are so true and, and so important at this time. We work worldwide. We work with the Writers Union of Canada, but we all need to become more local and not less less local because of those particular experiences, as well as understanding what goes on across the yeah. world, I think. And you mentioned bookstores, and I suppose one of the problems that we've all had with the pandemic and book bookstores being closed, certainly in the UK, is again, we're all buying from the same platforms and we're not having those hand-sold books. And supporting our local bookstores is tremendously important. Yeah, well, you, you can. They've been very inventive, and some of them have been doing yeah. pretty well. Yes. So I would say go to the lo local bookstore, see what they can offer you. Uh, do they have curbside pickup? Will they deliver? Uh, one of the ones in Canada, in Toronto, actually had a mystery bag. So you gave them this much money and told them your genre that you're interested in, and they would deliver a mystery bag. So I ordered a mystery bag of mysteries, and, and I hadn't read any of them. They did very well <laughs> in figuring out what I might not have read. <laughs> 
I, I, I do feel that I should let you go. And probably when you mentioned empire and we were drinking tea, that probably seems like the appropriate point to stop on. But thank you so much. It's been so, such a great privilege to do something jointly. And thank you to John. Um, we must do more. We work so close together. Thank you for all you've done over the years for the Writers' Union and for writers and for your wonderful work and for the wonderful imagination in it all. And um, thank you and good good luck to all of us. Thank, yes, we all need it. Thanks to our moderator today. Thank you for everyone who listened in. Thank you for the uh, donations to the two funds and please don't forget to give more. Um, this don't forget to buy the books from the local bookstores and from the local links that we've got. Our events in this series are continuing till the 10th of December, so you can head over to the Society of Authors and Events and join up um, for the huge range of things we've got left. The recordings from this festival will be available, and again, we'll give you a link. And let's continue the conversation on Twitter and later and elsewhere. And thank you to so much to everybody for being here. Thank you. Thank you. A pleasure.